for joining us today. I work here at Get Connected by Galaxy Digital in creative communications and outreach. And if you're not familiar with us, Get Connected is our best-in-class volunteer management software serving thousands of organizations across North America designed specifically to meet the needs of volunteer managers and their programs. And today we've got a special panel. We're going to talk about current trends in volunteer engagement from strength to strength. Um, I'll start off the panel by introducing Elizabeth Donovan. Elizabeth is the head of our Get Connected Network team, and Elizabeth brings her experience working with nonprofits as well as state organizations to connect communities through technology and relationships. And we're incredibly excited to kick off our 2024 season of volunteer leadership webinars with Faiza Van Zant. CBA, um, and FISA is the Executive Director of the Council for Certification in Volunteer Administration, and so grateful to have you here today. Um, a volunteer herself from a very young age, she's been an advocate for volunteer engagement and leaders of volunteers for the last 20 years, speaking, facilitating, and continually learning from others internationally. FISA is passionate about equity and access amongst volunteers and leaders of volunteers. She believes strongly that a community with a thriving volunteer base improves the overall quality of life and health of all its members. So we're just thrilled to have you here today. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. And we'll also have Shauna and AK. Um, they are regional managers from our Get Connected Network team, and they're going to join us today to manage the chat box where you can ask questions. Both Shauna and AK have a background in nonprofits and, um, and sourcing solutions for organizations, and so that's how they work with all of our uh, Get Connected Network members um, through building relationships with technology. So today we'll all work together to keep this a healthy and respectful space. We've got folks who are brand new to volunteer management and those who've been doing this for a while. So we'll really use that chat box to cross pollinate ideas and um, ask questions and really just enjoy ourselves today and have a really amazing time of community amongst volunteer leaders. So very excited about that. And just one more bit of housekeeping. If you would like to use closed captioning, you can do so at the bottom of your screen. So welcome. And now I do the part where I share <laughs> my screen. All right. So today we'll talk about current trends in volunteer engagement from strength to strength with our special guest, Faiza Van Zant, CBA. Here's what we'll cover today. We're gonna dive into the current trends in volunteer engagement heading into 2024 by exploring the innovation adoption life cycle of new trends, the benefits and challenges of the top four current trends in volunteer engagement, which I can't wait for us to reveal to you, and the practical steps for engaging your volunteers with innovative solutions this year. So stay to the end for practical tips on why it's important to use technology in volunteer engagement ethically and how to do that. The qualities of a trendsetter as a volunteer leader, which is going to be fun to talk about, and how to start applying these trends in your volunteer engagement. So let's dive in. What's a trend and why is it important to even pay attention to? Let's talk through this one. I feel like um, I have a nine-year-old in my house, so she has a very definite opinion on these trends. Um, I love that we're going to start with kind of grounding us in this definition. So a general direction in which something is developing or changing. So Faiza, tell us what that means for the workspace, for what we're doing. Thank you, Elizabeth. So when I think about trends and when I think about uh, leaders of volunteers, one of the competencies of leaders of volunteers is being able to be strategic in your volunteer engagement and how you um, involve volunteers in the work that you do. So to me, a strategic leader of volunteers is aware of trends, not only their own trends that are happening um, within the world of volunteering, but they're also thinking about um, they're, they're kind of thinking more broadly than that. And we're thinking about the trends that are affecting um, the not-for-profit and the charitable sector in general. And kind of just to get us thinking and thinking strategically, when I say that, I'm also thinking about 
how is it that you're going to influence by understanding what trends are, by understanding how to be strategic, how are you also going to influence like senior leaders at your organization? You're going to be able to do that by understanding what some of the trends are that they're paying attention to. I want to draw a little bit of attention to some of the work by the independent sector. Um, they released two um, amazing documents and they're always on trend in terms of uncovering data and interpreting it for our uh, industry. So one is their trust in civil society report that they released in September of 2023. And one of the things that they told us is um, that, you know, we've got a cost of living increase all over the world. It's not just in the United States, um, but there is, there are uh, people who are, you know, experiencing a cost of living increase, for example. And that relates to your financial health and your outlook in, on life relates to how you actually perceive not-for-profits. And what they found is that Americans who are doing better financially have more trust in not-for-profits. And that sometimes speaks to as well, who are the people that show up to volunteer in our organizations? They also um, released something around the health of the not-for-profit sector, their annual review, which, which came out two months ago. And one of the things that they found through that is that 59% of people did not volunteer in 2022, and that's down from 2021, right? So um, when we know that there's that many people in the population who are choosing not to volunteer for whatever reason, let's think of that as an opportunity. That's 59% of the population that could be you know, influenced to volunteer for us as well. And it tells us that we need to start doing things a little bit differently in how we recruit volunteers, how we appreciate volunteers, how we recognize them. Um, you know, We've got other, tr other trends and indicators that we'll get to in, in our webinar that tell us that we need to do um, things a little bit differently. Something else that that report uh, showed us is that 52% of Americans trust um, not-for-profits and that's down 7% um, from 2020. So uh, the general population's trust in not-for-profit seems to be um, falling as well. This is what our leadership and our organizations are paying attention to. This is affecting how we get funding. This is how we uh, is affecting how marketing trends in not-for-profit work. So these trends don't only involve volunteer engagement. We need to be able to see how all of these trends inter intersect broadly. Um, and how they how they will also affect um, how we recruit volunteers as well. Hey, Faisa, I want to jump in really quick. If we could just turn up the volume on your end just a little bit. I know we've got some people in the chat really excited about everything you're saying, just having a little bit of a hard time hearing, if you could, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I'm all the way up, but I'm going to unplug my headset and plug it back in and see if that helps. Awesome. Thank you. And we've got closed captions available as well. Um, I know some people have had some luck turning up their own volume on their computer too. So just want to put that out there. Thanks so much, Faiza. All right, hopefully that works. Um, if not, I, I don't know what else to do. My volume's all the way up here. So Faiza, you know, I, I find it really interesting. You've been doing this work professionally for 20 years. So how did you come to start noticing trends, observing trends, and really get to this point where you're like, we, this is something that we need to pay attention to and um, really spread the word on? So I started working in volunteer engagement as a volunteer. I led volunteers for a not-for-profit. It was like my summer volunteering that I did when I was at university. And when I was looking for some resources, I found my local AVA, um, TABA, and I realized, wow, there's a whole community of leaders of volunteers that do this professionally. Um, and hi to anyone that's here from TAVA. I see a couple of you and, and hi to some CVAs as well that are here. This is my 25th year in the sector. So I started doing this work in 2000. Um, and you know, one of the trends, and I, I, don't, I don't know necessarily that it's a trend anymore, but one of the realities of our sector is, is that there are a lot of people who fall into this work. There's a lot of people who start this work as volunteers and then move into it as a career. Um, and that's one of the things we also need to be aware of when we're thinking about how we can be effective in the work that we're doing, how we can be effective in um, profiling the work that we're doing, getting respect as a profession, um, you know, that currently there isn't necessarily like a track. Like if you take this program or if you get this degree, you'll be guaranteed a job at this rate. We kind of have to um, create those paths ourselves. And so for me, what became really important early on in understanding that is that I've got to be aware of trends. 
um, and I've got to be finding and seeking that information on my own. So kudos to everybody who's joining this webinar today and actually putting that kind of um, that that, pra that into practice as well. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. And let's dive in. What does this mean? Because I looked at this and I thought, hmm, this seems pretty important, but can you explain it a little bit in the context of what, what we're going to talk about today? Yeah. So Everett Rogers um, kind of wrote about what's called the innovation adoption life cycle back in the 60s, right? But this idea became really popularized by Simon Sinek. He did a TED Talk um, on cultural transformations within organizations. And he talked about this and he calls it the law of diffusion of innovations. And, and he kind of popularized this. When he was talking about what this means, you're, you're thinking about this life cycle in terms of um, how you can affect change culturally. Um, because of, you know, me always wanting to learn and think about like looking at what's happening outside of the volunteer engagement cycle and trying to apply it to volunteer engagement, I started to think about the innovation adoption life cycle in terms of trends for volunteer engagement. So what do I mean by that? So let's think about, um, because we're here uh, hosted by Galaxy Digital, let's, let's think about how we document volunteer involvement, for example, right? So when you think about a new trend that's, that's gonna happen, so let's, let's say a, a new volunteer database, for example, or how volunteers uh, apply to volunteer or track their hours, right? We've got innovators um, who are on one side of the life cycle who would say, there's a better way to do this, right? So I, you know, when I started doing this 25 years ago, we had paper and we had files. And when we had to track volunteer hours, we had to go through everybody's files, count up their timesheets, um, and determine how many volunteers and how many volunteer hours. And then someone was like, hey, we should be using Excel. I went to a workshop on uh, volunteer data collection. And so, you know, I was like, great, I want to use Excel. Um, there's always been, I know that when it comes to the innovation adoption life cycle, I'm someone who sits in that early adopter phase. An innovator is somebody who is, says, I'm excited to try something new. I have um, high tolerance for risk. Let's try different things. That's 2.5% of the population. Early adopters like myself see innovators having success. And even though there isn't like a lot of proven success with it, we're willing to like try it out. So that's how I went from my file system, my color coded beautiful file system, by the way, alphabetical, all of that, um, to the Excel spreadsheet, right? Um, and then I, you know, would move, change different jobs and I would find that I would go to a different job where someone's still using um, the file system, move them onto Excel. Oh, but then we started seeing our innovators coming up with things like uh, volunteer databases, right? So you could have a database where you stored everything on your computer or in the cloud, right? And then we started seeing, you know, moving on from that, we started seeing um, apps on your phone, right? So now you can actually apply to volunteer on your phone. You can check in and check out. You can sign up and schedule yourself um, through apps on your phone. All of that new technology are what those innovators come up with. The early adopters are the folks that will say, that looks really good. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in trying that out. That early majority are those people that need to see some proven success. And a big part of our population falls in there. They see that success happening and then they adopt it as well. And then there's the late majority that's got to that's got to keep up, right? Because everybody, you know, so many people are doing it. Almost 50% of the population are already doing it. You know, so they keep up. And then we've got our laggards, people who might be resistant to change, who might not have as many resources or the technology to keep up that have to do it to stay relevant, right? And so if you're, you know, um, if you're not using a database at this point, if it's not easy for volunteers to access your applications, to schedule themselves, to see where they stand, to get communications from you, um, and especially in a, in, a, in a time like now where volunteers are volunteering in more than one place and seeing what technology looks like, what adopt, what um, onboarding, what screening looks like in different organizations, they're gonna go where it's easy and, and where it's accessible. So the innovation adoption life cycle, the reason I bring it up when we're thinking about trends um, is because one of the things that we need to do as leaders of volunteers is be very self-aware of where we fall in the innovation adoption life cycle. Are we people who are really excited to try different things? Um, do we need to see some proven success before we give it a try? Do we wait? for a larger part of the population to do it and then you know follow on or are we always catching up 
right? So even though this innovation adoption life cycle is more about change management and cultural change, I look at it in terms of figure out where you fall on this um, in this life cycle in terms of when things are new and when things are different um, and figure out where you need to be when it comes to some of the trends um, that we're talking about. Are you excited to try some of these different things? Are you already doing it um, or are you playing catch up? One of the things that Go ahead. I think we talked a little bit about FISA before was just um, kind of your opinion on, because I feel like when I'm looking at this, I think Michelle brought this up in the chat, like there's certain things where I'm like, I'm an innovator. There's very few, let's be real. I'm, I tend to find myself naturally, my persona. I like early majority, late majority. I'm a little bit more cautious than some, but I think what is the healthy mix? Like, you know, I, I think when you look at the naming convention, nobody wants to be the laggard. That doesn't sound nice. But are there certain things where you're like, you can't be an innovator across the board because you'll never get anything actually starting to hit that repetition phase where you start to see better and better. So what, what's this good spread? I think that's just the thing before we move on. Like, what's the healthy yeah. mix? I think, I think it's such a good question because we have to be able to mix healthily because things will always come into play like our resources. Do we have um, the time? Do we have the money to be able to make some of these changes sometimes? Um, but also when you think about, I like to think about a, a shining moment in our profession was COVID. For me, there were so many innovators in the volunteer engagement space um, that were trying new things. They wanted to stay connected to volunteers. And we had people using apps like um, uh, all of the, the gaming apps to stay together. You know, we had people adopting Zoom really quickly, Teams really quickly, um, doing all of that kind of stuff. But then we had people that didn't have access to that technology, right? And we also had at the same time, many of us having to work from home, not having the space, caring for kids or caring for elderly. I think um, the way that I like to look at this is that when I'm ready to adopt a trend or think about a trend, I want to find out in my in my own being and in my core, where am I feeling? Am I feeling excited about this? This is something that I can really jump into. Is there something that I need? Buy-in, resources, more time to be able to do that. Um, so determining, you know, as per the situation where you fall. Sometimes, too, we don't have a choice. It's an emergency. I think about um, some of our colleagues on the call today that are um, at organizations like the Red Cross or in food pantries, where there's an emergency, we don't have a choice but to innovate when we have a lack of resources. And so we do find a lot of innovation happening when we're pushed to innovate, right? When we're always in a disaster situation or in an emergency situation, for example. One thing I really want to say about this before we move on is sometimes you in your role might be somewhere on this scale and the organization is somewhere else. And it doesn't always have to do with resources, but it does have to do sometimes with culture. And um, that's something that I've experienced because I'm on the like innovator side of the scale <laughs> and, and, you know, wanting to try new technologies. And so sometimes when um, I've been in organizations that are much more the late majority wanting to slowly adopt change. And then when an emergency would, would happen and there would be like a need to innovate, I'd be like, I'm ready for this. You know, it was like, this is my moment. But I, recognizing that sometimes you could you could also be in a late majority in your personality and the way you want to make decisions because you're concerned about your volunteer base and shaking things up too much. And, and then you might work at an organization that's on the other end of the scale that might be more like me. So um, I find that to be really interesting too and finding a way of like just being aware of that to, to navigate it. But I've experienced that a little bit. You know what the beautiful thing about that is we all engage volunteers and we can build teams for ourselves that are different than who we are. I'm working on a really exciting project right now where the team that I'm building are people who are different than me. I'm introverted. I'm extroverted. Uh, they work in food insecurity and I've never worked there before. You can always build a team where there are innovators if you're not one. And sometimes you also want those laggards on your team because you want to know um, what all, um, you know, what are all the things that the laggards are going to bring up um, that you can then be prepared for as well. So, so we get the opportunity to do that as well, because we're good at building teams and recruiting people to help. Well, let's go ahead and dive in. What are these top four trends? Let's just read them real quick so that we can get into it. Yeah. So today we are going to talk about trends in recruitment. We're going to talk about trends in service learning. Uh, people might understand service learning as internships, co-ops, um, trying to think if there's any other words for that, but that's what we mean by service learning. We're going to talk about 
equity and access, and then we're going to end by talking about ChatGPT and artificial intelligence. So let's let's dive into recruitment. I am going to try to unplug my headphones and see if the volume is better for people. I'm curious how many people were surprised by seeing ChatGPT on there. <laughs> That's been a, I've been waiting to see, so we'll get to that at the end. All right, Courtney, are you getting any feedback from my end right now? I just took my headphones out. Okay, great. You sound great. All right. So when we're thinking about recruitment of volunteers, this is something most definitely when you think of the independent sector and their report on the number of people who aren't volunteering. Um, and also with the CVA community and the volunteer engagement community globally, recruitment is top of mind and something that people are thinking about more and more. And one of the things we need to get on board on is we need to understand that who is volunteering is changing, right? A lot of us have volunteer programs that are set up and are based on recruiting older adults, uh, traditionalists, boomers, even um, Gen Xers, of, of which I am. And, you know, as of last year, 70% of the American workforce are now millennials. And we need to think about the implications of that on not only on our workforce, but also in who is showing up and who is able uh, to volunteer and who has the different skill sets that we need. Um, what we know about millennials is that millennials are not interested um, and have unlearned a lot of language around saviorism. They're not wanting to be put up on pedestals and lauded as superheroes when it comes to volunteering. They want to be in partnership with organizations. They want to be in partnership with communities as well. And so our recruitment messaging and the tactics that we use also need to mimic that. We need to think about volunteer recruitment in terms of partnerships um, and, pedest and not pedestals and not you know, putting our volunteers up on a pedestal um, as a way of recruiting them as well. The other thing that we need to do is we need to be centering community in all aspects of the volunteer cycle. And what I mean by that is we can't be using um, tactics like fear and saviorism to recruit people to volunteer, right? And we're gonna talk about that a little bit around when we think about equity, but centering community as part of our strategic response to involving the community um, in volunteering in their own needs, right? To address um, that their, their own needs or their own lack of resources is really important. I'm hearing from a lot of people that there is this um, charge that is coming from the, the, the C-suite or the leadership in your organizations, we need to diversify our volunteer base. And that's what a lot of people are tasked with. If you haven't already centered the community that you serve um, or that the community that you partner with in your volunteer strategy, um, it, it's going to be very difficult for you to recruit a diverse volunteer base to begin with. If you are talking about your community in terms of all of their deficits, in terms of all of the things that they lack, you're not gonna have the confidence of that community in terms of wanting to come and volunteer with you. So you've gotta center your community as a strategy all the way from when you're building your volunteer strategies, when you're redoing your volunteer recruitment messaging, um, even the questions that you ask in your volunteer interviews, right? Are you thinking about the questions that you're asking from an, uh, an equity lens, right? One of an easy way to do this, involve community members that you serve um, in some of your planning. Ask them if the way that you talk about them in your literature makes them feel great, talks about where they are from an asset base versus what, what we perceive that they might be needing or what they as an under-prioritized under community has to be needing um, because they've been under-prioritized. The other thing that you want to do is share responsibility, share the risk, and share the control around volunteer resources with, with the staff that you work with. You don't have to be that one person department that does everything. Um, start to build a culture of volunteer staff partnerships internally. I did a podcast around this called uh, Being the Architect of Your Volunteer Experience. It's part of the Time and Talent podcast, and you can hear a little bit more about them there. But basically what I'm talking about is if you can build internally a culture where all staff see themselves as the volunteer leaders and not just you, you start to build capacity um, for those in your organization to also recruit volunteers, but you also start to build an appreciation for um, uh, what it takes to involve volunteers and the skills and the competencies of volunteer leaders amongst all your staff. And then you start to build 
this whole group of volunteer leaders amongst your staff as well. So be willing to share that responsibility and that risk and that control. Do whatever you can to build staff capacity and working with volunteers. Maybe that's giving your um, staff a training, right, on um, how to best partner with volunteers um, or, you know, relinquishing some of the control. Maybe you don't do all of the data entry, but staff do some of their data entry. Um, maybe you don't do all of the interviewing of volunteers, but the staff who are actually going to work with those volunteers and partner with them, they take on some of those tasks as well. The other thing you want to think about when it comes to recruitment are things that are kind of out of our control, but that we can still address and react to. So post COVID, right, if you, um, you know, when I take myself back to my own experience during COVID, I was really isolated. I wasn't doing a lot of the things that I love, one of which included volunteering, but I also wasn't traveling. I wasn't spending time with family and friends. A lot of life celebrations and milestones were happening over Zoom, you know, or were happening just in my little family of four on the 21st you know, floor of our building in the sky. It was super isolating. And what we found is that coming out of COVID, transition is now becoming really constant. People are transitioning jobs. COVID was really illuminating for people in terms of, you know, where am I spending my time? How am I making my livelihood? Um, people are going back to school. People are changing their schooling programs. Um, importance on family and friends and celebrating together finding opportunities to be together is a priority for people getting back to travel. All of those things are way more prioritized for people than volunteering at the moment. So it's not surprising that there's a dip that we're feeling right now. But I can tell you over like the last 24 years that I've been managing the volunteers, we see those dips all the time, right? If we can anticipate those that they're happening, um, what we need to do is be prepared for that wave to come back up because, you know, when people get past being able to travel again, you know, getting settled in work again, getting um, used to being a remote worker now where I used to commute, um, they will find that they're ready to start to find purpose in their life again, ready to start wanting to connect with community again. We're going to see this as well with a lot of people who found ways to connect with community during COVID. Um, you know, through peer-to-peer -peer help and mutual aid and neighborhood groups that were popping up where there weren't barriers to access to entry, right? And so people are going to remember those opportunities that they had to be involved in community and want to come back and do it um, in a way where it's um, they're able to, to make time for it in their schedule as well. The other thing we have to anticipate is that remote work is now an expectation for so many people. Um, kudos to all of our frontline workers um, who don't have this option um, I admire you for your resilience throughout COVID and, and not having this. Uh, I'm really grateful that this is an option for me, however, and, you know, being able to, to work remotely means that I've freed up some time in my day. I don't have to commute. Um, I'm saving four hours a day, not having to drop my kids at childcare and then commute and then commute back and pick them up again. And so I'm using that time differently, right? And I'm thinking about um, how can I use that those beginning hours of the day or those end hours of the day other than getting a little bit more sleep differently? And I'm looking for remote volunteer opportunities um, as well. So, you know, for all of us, there aren't going to be every volunteer opportunity is not going to be remote. But if you want to engage that part of the population that's looking for that, try to think about ways you can incorporate that. There are tons of webinars out there. There's tons of literature out there on how to do this. Um, and so if it's something that you're curious about, figure out what you can do to engage those remote volunteers. It also opens you up to a, to a broader group of people, right, in different time zones, in different countries, um, and not just people who are local to your community and can physically make it, um, you know, to your building. And all of that to say that we all now have this new meaning of time for, for so many of us. Um, being able to be remote or having to have spent time indoors and away from family because of this experience with COVID. And even for those of us who were on the front lines, what we were being expected to do and what many of you made it through on the front lines with limited time and resources, um, a lot of us are questioning what time means to us and to our families and how we're going to be spending that time. We've got to put into account how much time it takes to volunteer. So if you are an organization that is a rural based organization and volunteers are only able to get to you if they can drive. Um, how much time is it taking them to get to you and how much time are they spending to volunteer with you and then how much time is it taking um, 
for them to go home? Are those efforts things that you can track as well, right? Can you give volunteers credit for and kudos for the time that it's taking? Um, for some of us, you know, when we're when it's the remote volunteering, um, you know, we're thinking again about um, what time are we asking people to spend on the front end and training and orientation and, and just being respectful and mindful that it's not just about the hours or the shifts that volunteers spend with you. It's all of the effort and time it takes for them to be able to show up and be able to volunteer. And on our end, being really appreciative of, appreciative of that and recognizing that um, because people are more aware than ever of, of what it takes um, in terms of their time. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. All right. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, let's move on to thinking about service learning. Um, so for some of us, what this this is the idea that when you are engaged in a high school program or a post-secondary program, um, that there's this component of learning that is tied to your success and your completion of that program. So where I'm from in Ontario, Canada, students have to do 40 hours of community involvement in order to graduate. Um, when I was a student in social work, I had to do three placements um, throughout three of my university years in order to graduate. And that, that's what we're talking about um, when we're thinking about service learning. A lot of organizations that have a robust volunteer program are capturing service learning, whether it's through co-ops, internships, um, in the volunteer program. And we're seeing that it's not a unique role. There, aren't, um, there are fewer people who are uniquely identified in an organization to take care of service learning. A lot of that is falling onto the um, plates of volunteer engagement managers. Service learning is booming now more than ever. So, and, and a part of this is because it's gained popularity and people are seeing the value of having um, experience and being able to um, be more employable once they graduate from a post-secondary program. But part of that is capitalism at play. And, and I, we gotta be really honest here and that for a lot of uh, organizations that are in, in higher ed, service learning is a really easy way to collect tuition dollars, okay? And what we're seeing through COVID is um, that enrollment in post-secondary institutions went down drastically because people wanted that in-person learning. They didn't want that remote learning. Um, and now that their remote learning uh, is, a, is a reality and some people are comfortable with it, um, people are not necessarily going to uh, higher education institutions for that learning. They're doing things like coming to webinars, right? Getting their um, information and their access to that education in different ways that's more affordable and that's more accessible. Knowing this and knowing that this is a trend, it's an opportunity for us as leaders of volunteers to get ahead of it. Be proactive, right? If you have students that are coming to you, um, design volunteer roles that are specific to that. Ones that are, they can be transactional, they're time limited, where it's easy to onboard people, where it's easy to have a really great and robust exit process as well. Have volunteer roles that are specific for students versus trying to have these generalized roles that we try to fit students into. And then we have this recruitment pro uh, problem because those interactions are transactional. Get ahead of it and design roles that are specific for students. Um, make sure that the roles that you have um, are, are desirable and that they're niche, right? If you're gonna have these service learning opportunities, then you wanna be one of those organizations that people want to have their service learning opportunity with. Um, you want those to be coveted, right? So you wanna make sure that you're not, a, you know, don't be afraid to design roles and attract a niche group of students from a specific program or from um, a specific skill set than trying to have service learning opportunities that are available for anyone who is a student, right? You wanna be desirable, you wanna have, um, a lot of people applying to your roles you want to have that niche and while you're there you want to have memorable experiences and you want to be creating future ambassadors from these service learners right um and what i mean by that is when somebody is coming to you and if you design roles that are specifically for students you know if, if they're following for example like a semestered schedule in a university the other thing that you could also be doing is designing opportunities for some of those students to participate in trainings that staff are part of, right? Be part of a staff meeting. Um, create these memorable experiences that they might not have if they were um, a volunteer, but it's different for them because they are a student doing a service learning position instead. I also wanna encourage all of us who are working with 
colleges and universities and even high schools to start pushing back and start asking for a piece of the pie. And what do I mean by that? Be brave and be courageous and start asking for what's in it for your organization and what's in it for you, right? Organizations are collecting tuition dollars, you know, upwards of $500 to $1,000 um, per student to take a course, which is, has a service learning component. But all of the work of that course is being downloaded on us as leaders of volunteers. We're providing the physical space. We're providing the staff, the training, and the opportunity. And it's okay for us to say, what are we going to get in return for that? Can we have space at your, at your campus for a volunteer recognition event, for a staff training? Can we get discounts on tuition? Are there resources that um, universities might have access to tech, access to databases, things like that? Um, uh, subscriptions to journals. There's so many different things that um, universities and colleges are rich in resources that would be easy for them to share with us. And so they're not gonna share it if we don't ask, right? And so it's okay for us to ask what's in it for us, right? I worked at an organization in Toronto where we had 1,200 uh, youth who were doing service learning, either co-ops um, uh, or high school student placements or college placements. And we started pushing back, right? If we're going to take 100 of your students every year, what are we going to get out of that um, in return? And that's what we mean by um, being ahead of this trend of service learning being on the rise and the demand for us to meet that um, happening at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. I was a part of a service learning program at university and I was required to do 240 hours of service annually. So it's, it was quite, a, it was quite extensive. Um, and I do hope those organizations got something more out of it than, than just the hours, you know? Yeah, I had to do 400 hours for three years, like 400 hours in my second year, and then again in my third year, and then again in my fourth year. And, and, and when I think about it now being on this side of leading volunteers, I also think about the hour it took for me to get to my placement, the time that I spent there, the hour that it took me to get back. There's just so much that's there. And it's okay for us as leaders of volunteers to push back and say, what can we get out of it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure it's no surprise when we think about equity and access as a trend. Um, I hate that it's, it is trendy right now that, you know, ac equity, access, diversity, inclusion, justice initiatives, um, you know, they do feel kind of trendy right now, but they've always been around. You know, we've always been wanting to be a more, um, we've always been wanting to recruit people and we've always been wanting to make volunteerism as accessible as possible. And so, you know, for all of us, we've got organizations that have statements out there saying that we want to be inclusive of all, that we want to make everyone feel welcome, that we want to have um, a sense of belonging, right, amongst all of the stakeholders in our organization. How do we respond to that, right? For us in our world of, of leading volunteers, we need to be really intentional and really honest about what is in our purview and what we can actually do, right? The reality is that for some of us, people need to physically be able to get to our buildings and to get into our buildings to be able to volunteer. So we've got to be honest about who we can actually be welcoming to and, and uh, who we can you know, provide those experiences to. We need to say things like, you know, instead of saying, you know, we welcome everyone to our organizations, we need to be honest and say, we welcome anyone to our organization who's able to volunteer in this location, right? or who's able to volunteer from this time to this time. Because the reality is, if we don't have volunteer opportunities that are available 24 seven, we're not actually open and available and inclusive to everybody. If we don't have buildings that are accessible, if we don't have equipment that is accessible to different learning styles or different learning needs, um, different levels of hearing, different levels of vision, then we're not equitable and we're not exclusive. So we need to be honest about that um, because people are looking at our recruitment tactics. They're looking at what we're saying and that public trust in, vol in volunteerism and not-for-profits is declining because people can see through the fact that these overarching broad statements about wanting to be welcoming and wanting to be inclusive are not true because people are showing up in the workplace. People are showing up to get their groceries. People are showing up to volunteer and are constantly being met by barriers from people who are using the same messages of wanting to be inclusive. So it's okay to say that we wanna be inclusive and it's also okay to say that we can only be inclusive in these spaces or during this time frame. 
um, it's okay for us to be honest about that and to say that we're working on being more inclusive and then to do that work. We also need to make volunteerism really personal for people, right? Um, we, we need to build into volunteer experiences how people can be reflective of their work. We need to ask volunteers uh, to challenge their biases around what they thought their volunteer work was gonna be like, you know, and then check in with them a month or two later and ask them, how's it going? Is it what you thought it was gonna be like? What have you learned, um, you know, that you weren't expecting to learn? Is there anything that's, that surprised you, you know, as you've been volunteering? Build in these opportunities for reflection. A lot of us who are doing volunteer evaluations, volunteer satisfaction, we're gauging how happy our volunteers are with, with what we do. We're asking them to grade us on, you know, did we onboard you well? You know, did you have the training that you needed? But we're not asking our volunteers what's what's different, you know, what what reflections have you had that are different? We're not asking them in a way to challenge their biases and connect us um, to the work. We're not making it personal for them, right? So we need to do a little bit more of that, right? Um, our reflections and our learnings are not outcomes for the community, right? So when somebody changes their biases, that doesn't necessarily result in community outcomes, um, but we need to create opportunities for that um, so that our volunteers can see their role and what those community outcomes could be, right? We also need to ask our volunteers, well, what's next for you, right? Now that you know a little bit more about food insecurity, right? Now that you've seen the faces of people that come to our food bank, right? Or who access our food pantry, what's changed for you? Is it gonna change the way you shop? Is it gonna change the way you vote? Is it gonna change the way you do advocacy in your community? We need to have these conversations. We also need to remember that volunteers have choice, right? And when it comes to equity and, and access, uh, all of us are looking for volunteers. There's a lot of choice that's out there. And using messaging around fear and saviorism and saying things like, we need you, we need to move beyond that. And we need to say to people, it's not just that we what we need you, it's this is what you'll be able to achieve for us. So we need to move our, um, our messaging. And one of the things that that independent sector re report said is that organizations that are only using data to recruit volunteers and to recruit donors are not having as much success as organizations that are using storytelling, for example, as a way to recruit volunteers. Um, one of my CVA colleagues, Jessica Pang Parks, I think she's here on this webinar today, did an incredible article on ethical storytelling for leaders of volunteers. It's part of the Engage Journal. Um, if you're looking for unpacking this, how do we change recruitment from the we need you to the storytelling? Um, read what Jessica's written um, and and Think about the different ways that you can um, recruit volunteers, what your website communication could look like, um, what your materials could look like in a way that instead of saying, we need you, we couldn't do it without you, we say, this is what, what's at stake. Here's the impact that you can make on the community. Do you want it? We're inviting you to be a part of it. Do you wanna be involved um, in these community outcomes? Um, and, the, and these are all the ways that we can honor the communities that we partner with and for, and see them from that asset-based um, way. When we involve volunteers and when we message volunteers in a way that they partner communities versus you're the superhero, you're the heart and the soul, right? Um, that is that is getting rid of that saviorism language and moving more towards partnership and community-based language as well. There's an interesting thing I'm seeing in the chat, Faisa, where they're actually saying like what you're talking about here almost feels a little bit like service learning because in a service learning course, we expect the student to be learning something, to be reflecting on their experience, applying it to what they're going to do in their career path or whatever it might be. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, how that reflection piece might be something they can think about for both students, but just volunteers in general? So that as you're saying, we're starting to reflect in a way that makes it personal to the volunteers so that they're part of what's changing as well as what they're working on. Yeah, I think, you know, we are in a, we, when we think about the charitable sector in general, the charitable sector is really good at centering themselves as the antidote to the community's issues, right? If we were to think about our messaging, if we were think, if we were to think about training and orientation from volu for volunteers from an equity standpoint, it would change the way in which we deliver that, right? So if you're training and onboarding volunteers, part of what you're gonna be doing in that process to, to really respect and honor this piece is 
starting to train and, and orient volunteers to the community that they're a partner and that they're a part of, right? And you start to, um, you know, introduce your volunteers to that community. Maybe you have members of that community deliver part of your training, right? It comes, it, it feels different. For example, if you're working, um, you're working in addictions, for example, right? It's going to feel different to, to receive messages around the impact of your work and why certain parts of your training are important when it's from the leader of volunteers who may have zero proximity to that community, zero, I'm talking about myself, zero proximity, zero experience with that, and I'm delivering the training. But if it's a volunteer counterpart that, that I partner with that's from the community that's delivering that training and is able to make it relevant to their lived experience, it's gonna be received in a different way. That's how you make it personal. Um, versus just here's a training that I have to go to that's like very sterile. We go, you know, through a book and then we sign off on stuff at the end. Center the community that you're with. I'll say center the community all the time. You'll hear it all the time from me because the more you bring that community um, and their voice and their experience into the work that you do, the more personal you make it for the volunteers, the easier you make it to make that volunteer understand the impact of their work as well. That's where the stories come out. That's where you get these um, options to do storytelling um, as well. And you're right, in service learning, that's already built in, right? And most of those courses and that curriculum, that reflection piece is already built in. So if we're already doing it there, why can't we do it when it's not service learning? Um, and the answer is we can, right? We just have to, again, be ahead of the trends, look at it a little bit from outside of what we do and see where we can draw on knowledge from other places as well. Excellent. All right, we're gonna dive in to chat GPT and see how this can support volunteer leaders. Support the innovators oh, was, was so excited about this piece of um, chat GPT. So we know that chat GPT, um, which stands for chat generative pre-trained transformer. That's what it stands for. We hear chat GPT all the time. Um, this was a product that was created by an organization called OpenAI. Some of you who are following this know there was lots of uh, leadership drama with OpenAI over the holidays. Um, but OpenAI created um, this technology like a year and two months ago, right? So in um, uh, November of 2022, this is really, really new technology, right? It's rapidly developing. We're seeing flaws in it. We're seeing all the different things that innovators aren't scared of. They're willing to try new things, to make mistakes, to rebuild again. Um, and I'm really grateful to an organization like OpenAI for being willing to fall flat on their face to make those mistakes, right? So this is new technology. It's rapidly developing. So if you're an early adopter, um, and I know that there are some people on this um, webinar that are, you've already tried ChatGPT and AI with um, your volunteer program. So AI is something that's been around for a really long time. If you are somebody that does text messaging and there's predictive text, maybe in your Gmail, you start to type something and then it finishes the sentence for you. Um, maybe you're on a customer service call and a bot can listen to your words and direct you in the right way. Artificial intelligence has been around for a long time. ChatGPT is leveraging artificial intelligence in a new way. And what artificial intelligence is, is a computer's ability to learn from what you tell it and from what you input into it to think for itself and then to make decisions, okay? So as leaders of volunteers, this is like a moment in time where we can have a huge influence, okay? And if you are part of a under-prioritized community. This is a moment in time where you can have a huge influence as well because uh, ChatGPT learns from what we input into it, okay? And so all the all the times we ask ChatGPT questions, it's logging all of that and then it's spitting it out. So if I am always asking ChatGPT to help me um, in my volunteer engagement practice with reference letters, and I'm doing that all the time, and there are 10 other people that are doing that all the time, when that 11th or that 20th or that 100th person goes to do it, ChatGPT has already started gathering a lot of data around reference, reference letters. It's They're getting refined along the way. Um, and so, you know, down the road, when someone goes to get a reference letter done, it just gets perfected and it gets better and better as we go along. 
But if we're scared, right, if we're those late adopters or those laggards and we don't try this technology out, um, people who are not in our field and people who don't practice what we do um, are going to skew the results of what come out. So we have an amazing opportunity right now um, to fill ChatGPT with lots of our volunteer uh, information and our needs as leaders of volunteers. So how can you use it? You can use uh, ChatGPT to automate responses, right? So if you've got uh, an inbox or an email that your volunteer responses go to, you can you can ask ChatGPT when you see these keywords pop up, respond with this message, right? Um, when somebody says, I'm going to be missing my shift, for example, there's a message that you can respond with, or I have to cancel my shift. Here's a message that you can respond with. So you can do things like automating responses uh, to inquiries for volunteers um, or candidates to be volunteers or from your volunteers um, already so that they know that your message has been received or so that they get the response that gives them an answer that they're looking for. You can chat, you can use chat GBT as well um, for things like, you know, creating reference letters for your volunteers. I've done that with um, some CVAs that I've worked with who are looking for reference letters, right? I can ask chat GBT um, to, you know, input some information um, and then, you know, create a reference letter for me. It helps me because it creates a template that I can then um, start to work with, right? I'm not starting from scratch. ChatGPT can do stuff like creating reports, right? So say you have a volunteer satisfaction survey, you can tell ChatGPT, I want you to create a report um, uh, and I want you to report on these three outcomes, this many of my volunteers, um, I had this many volunteers this year, they did this many hours, um, you know, they did this really cool event, I want you to include these six pictures and ChatGPT will come up with a report for you. Um, you can also use chatbots, right? So you can screen conversations with volunteers. We see this happening all the time when we go online to do banking, right? When we go online to buy things um, and we're using it all the time, right? So if you go, um, uh, I just went and bought some clothes from a website and this little bot helped me to like, to, to narrow down what it is that I was looking for. We're using them this all the time and there's nothing that's stopping us from trying to experiment with using this um, in our organizations as well. And even if your organization's not ready to use it, there's nothing stopping you from playing with it on your own so that when your IT says, hey, we're rolling out this new thing, you're ready, you're ready to go, just like Court is in her organization. ChatGPT can also do research for you, right? So you can go into ChatGPT and say, tell me about any studies that have happened, you know, around volunteer retention, uh, in a disaster situation, right? Or tell me about youth volunteerism uh, and homelessness. You know, can you tell me about any research that's there? You can use um, ChatGPT to pull from the different databases that it has access to or what people have given it access to to give you information. Something else that's really cool, and we've talked about storytelling and how effective that is, is that you can use um, ChatGPT to generate social media, right? You can say, hey, I've got these six pictures. Um, I have these facts. Can you, you know, create for me nine Instagram posts on um, the impact of volunteering uh, in Iowa um, during uh, the summer break and opportunities that are available? And ChatGPT will generate um, some of those things for you. And as exciting as it is, um, and how there are, you know, practical uses for ChatGPT, right? We also have to be really ethical in how we use artificial intelligence and volu in volunteerism as well. So we have to remember that ChatGPT is in its infancy stage. It needs guiding and it needs nurturing. So whatever it spits out to you, you have to edit it. You have to see if it's telling you what it is that you needed to tell you. If there were mistakes, sometimes you need to go back and ask the question differently. You gotta play around with it a little bit as well. It's not instantaneous um, and it's not perfect. ChatGPT learns as we do and includes all of our biases. And that's why it's so important for as many of us to be using it, in my opinion, as possible. And also for those of us who have ever found themselves being marginalized or a part of a community that's not in the majority, we need to be using it as well because we need to understand that when there's a homogenous group of people using a, a type of technology, biases are adopted. So, um, we need to be using it so that it can learn um, different biases and it can start to lose um, some of those biases and start to correct its own thinking and know um, how to do that. 
ChatGPT makes mistakes just like we do, and it and we gotta ha we gotta check its work, right? It's gonna sometimes give you a uh, a reference letter, or if it's gonna give you social media content, and the context quite isn't right. So we've got to check the work before we just put it out there. Um, we also need to make sure that we are creating and revisiting policies frequently when it comes to anything around artificial intelligence and um, volunteerism. We don't need new policies. A lot of our policies around computer use, a lot of our policies around confidentiality and information already exist, right? It's just thinking about how we do that with artificial intelligence. What I, what I mean by that, when you ask ChatGPT to create a reference letter for you, you're not gonna put the volunteer's data in that reference letter. That now becomes data that ChatGPT has. So now if you do that, your volunteers um, so say, for example, you upload your Excel, Excel spreadsheet of all your volunteers' data and you say, you know, create 100 letters for these 100 volunteers of their volunteer service hours. If you're giving ChatGPT that information, it now has all of those people's addresses, their phone numbers, all of that kind of stuff. You haven't violated an artificial intelligence policy in your organization. You've violated a confidentiality or um, information policy in your organization. So you don't need to create new things around artificial intelligence, you just need to understand how it exists with um, the policies that are already there. And for those policies that are already there, do they need to be revisited? Do they need to be enhanced because of new technology that you're gonna use? You also need to be really transparent about where you use um, ChatGPT, right? If you use it to create a LinkedIn post, just say, I use ChatGPT to help me create this LinkedIn post, or I use ChatGPT to help me create this report. Be honest about where you're using it um, so that people are aware of that as well. If you're gonna use a bot, for example, give your bot a name, right? Paisa is a great name, by the way. Um, you could give your bot a name, give it a personality, and also let people know it's a bot. I'm all, I love when I go to a website and there's that, can I help bubble on the side? And it identifies itself as a bot right away. Um, Cause then I know whether the bot can help me or whether I, I know that I need customer service. Um, and we've done this in the past already, right? How many of us had are using the phone sometimes and we have to press option one, two, or three, and we immediately go to the zero. I want the operator, I want the operator. It's the same kind of thing when we're thinking about um, using bots as well. I'll just encourage for a second, Court. Um, I recently used chat GBT for the first time. So maybe I am more of the laggard versus the late adopter. I don't know. Um, but I would encourage you with all the great ideas that Faiza just said, just pick one thing because I had something, I'll be honest, that I was like, I wish Court could read this and make it better, but Court only can do so much. So someone was like, well, just put it in there and say, make this more friendly or make this less formal. I saw that in the chat, like just give it a different voice. And I did it just one letter up loaded it what would you rewrite this to say and I was like uh oh, it's it's actually sounds so much better than what Elizabeth wrote um but it did it just gave me that confidence to try one thing so bearing in mind what Fiza talked about like making sure pull out the personal name put one thing in it and just say you know write this like it's marketing write this less formal write this more formal pull out the point like pick something and try one thing um I've used it many 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 times since then but it was just that hesitation because I hear the list of what it could do and I'm like well that's scary I don't know how to do all that try one thing and then Fiza's lift is like oh and now I can do all of these other things now I feel comfortable so don't be scared to try one thing that really made a difference for me you, you got to give yourself credit, Elizabeth. I would say you are an early adopter for sure. Um, you bring up a really good point, right, about how you can ask ChatGPT to, to, to give it a different tone or a different voice. If we're thinking about um, ChatGPT and equity, for example, you can say, like, um, here's an invitation to my volunteers. Make it fun for my youth volunteers, right? Um, use language for, um, you know, someone from the ages of 14 to 24 or, um, you know, use language that um, my older adult volunteers might like. So make this invitation um, appealing for like 55 to 75 and you'll see like different messaging will come back, come back from you as well. So kind this of an action packed hour. <laughs> We're like rounding out the end here. And I, I feel like we could probably keep talking all day. Um, and don't worry, Faiza will be back in a few months. So we'll see Faiza again um, here at the Get Connected um, webinar. But we'll just kind of summarize everything really quickly. If you want to um, read through these, Faiza, and just give everyone a little bit of takeaway just to remind what we talked about. And we will share all the resources um, following up. You'll see those Monday in your email inbox. So yeah. 
what I'm really hoping is that that today was empowering and that you feel like you have uh, a little bit more information to like move forward, right? I love this quote by Steve Jobs that says, innovation is the ability to see change as an opportunity and not a threat. So if you're finding yourself feeling overwhelmed, if you're finding yourself feel like, I'm not sure where to start, I, I, this is your permission to say like, you know, follow Elizabeth's wise words, just pick one thing. You don't have to do everything that we talked about today, but be empowered to pick one thing um, and I can see that the chat box is going bananas with links and with uh, different things that people are recommending. Just pick one thing and remember that as a leader of volunteers, we have immense power. We have immense privilege in the role that we have um, in that people want to share their time with us, right? And so we don't need to always seek permission um, to be curious, right? And to try different things. Um, we can go ahead and try them. We can try things out in, in other contexts as well, like planning an event for your family and then bringing it into planning your volunteer recognition event through things like ChatGPT or AI. There's kind of nothing stopping us um, from being curious and um, from trying those things and just from really sitting in the power and the privilege we have as leaders of volunteers um, in the work that we do. So be proactive when you're creating those service learning roles um, keep your equity initiative focused on those um, community outcomes. Remember to have fun and experiment with AI and chat GPT and to do it ethically because you're still a really important part of that process. Um, and think about where your organization is in the innovation adoption lifecycle with different things. It could be with diversity. It could be with volunteerism. It could be with donor recognition, all the different um, things your organization is a part of. Access where your organization's at, where you're at, where do you need to start to get ready for things? Where might you be ahead of the curve? Um, you know, and, and be ready, right? That's what, that's what trendsetters uh, are. They're ready and, and able to go. So Courtney, let's round it out with what a trendsetter is. Oh, I guess we don't have that. Oh one. yeah, go for go it. Ahead. No, you go ahead. I'm good. I would, <laughs> go ahead and tell us a little bit about a trendsetter as we like say goodbye to everyone. Cause I know folks are logging off, but we still have a couple hundred people with us. And yeah. a lot of people I think are going to try chat GPT this afternoon. <laughs> We're going to break the internet everyone. Um, <laughs> and tomorrow there'll be this volunteer person that tries it. And there'll be so much data in there because of our effort today. Um, thank you. Thanks for being part of this. A trendsetter is curious. A trendsetter is not afraid. A trendsetter can see themselves um, and what they do, but they can look outside and they can see the organization and the community and what they're facing as well. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks to Court and the team as well for uh, managing that awesome um, chat box as well. Yes, I want to thank Faiza for being here for our opening webinar. Um, this is the Get Connected webinar series dedicated to innovative approaches to volunteer leadership. So this was an amazing way to start uh, 2024 off. And we'll see you again in a couple of months. And I believe Shauna also dropped the link in the chat box to our February webinar, um, which will be featuring guest speaker Dante Curtis of Catch Your Dream Consulting. Um, and Dante Curtis is going to be talking about um, the wisdom of Black history and how that can strengthen volunteerism by really diving into what is DEIA. So please do join us for that February 22nd. Um, the registration for that is live as of right now. You're the first ones to hear about it. So you'd be the early adopters of signing up for that webinar. And um, again, if you want to learn more about the Council for Certification and Volunteer Administration, you can check out their website at cvacert.org. And if you want to hear more about what we do at Get Connected by Galaxy Digital, you can um, head to our learning center that's on our blog, galaxydigital.com slash blog. You can also email us anytime at info at Galaxy Digital if you want to learn more about the technology that we seek to innovate specifically for volunteerism and volunteer leaders. So thank you so much for being here today. We will follow up with you with the recording. You will get the slides. You will get the chat. You will get tons of bonus links and resources. And we're just incredibly grateful for your spending time with us today. So thank you. Thanks, Faiza. Thanks, team.